I'm Carolyn Canock from Lake Pend Oreille Waterkeeper. Did you know that Lake Pend Oreille is the largest lake in Idaho and the fifth deepest in the nation with depths of over 1,100 feet? But the water in Lake Pend Oreille hasn't stayed the same since it was formed over 11,000 years ago. Have you ever wondered about how the water in our freshwater lakes might change? Over time and throughout the year, our lakes go through many different changes, such as temperature, color, clarity, who lives in the lake, and the quality of the water. For chapter two of our Lake Ecology course, we're gonna dive into the complicated nature of water in lakes. Let's begin by exploring two of the most important nutrients in lake ecosystems, phosphorus and nitrogen. The levels of these two elements in the water can have a major impact on the ecosystem within and around the lake. They naturally come from the soil washing in from the surrounding area, such as through floods, erosion, and tributaries. Nitrogen and phosphorus support plant growth, which in turn provides food, habitat, and dissolved oxygen in the water. However, maintaining the appropriate balance of these two elements is necessary to keep our ecosystems healthy. A lack of balance disrupts the ecosystem within and around the lake. For example, excessive plant growth, such as algae blooms caused by excess nutrients, can release toxic chemicals that can kill fish and decrease recreational opportunities for all of us. Another element that's important to lake ecosystems and necessary for almost all living things is oxygen. When oxygen occurs in water, we call it dissolved oxygen. The amount of dissolved oxygen in water can tell us a lot about the quality of the water. Dissolved oxygen is usually either produced by plants through photosynthesis, which is when green plants use energy from the sunlight to create food and oxygen from carbon dioxide and water, or it's diffused from the atmosphere at the water's surface. Oxygen diffusion occurs naturally when the higher concentrations of oxygen in the atmosphere diffuse into the lower concentrations of oxygen in the water, or when the air mixes with the water, such as when a stream flows over rocks or when a waterfall crashes into a pool. One interesting water fact is that the amount of dissolved oxygen in the water is influenced by its temperature. Generally, warmer water holds less oxygen than colder water. Life in lakes relies on the amount of oxygen in the water. However, the amount of oxygen in a lake is different based on the season, climate, and what's living in the lake. Next, let's discuss how temperature affects water and its impact on the functioning of lake ecosystems. Water is hands down one of the most fascinating substances on Earth. For example, it's one of the few substances where the solid form is less dense than the liquid form. When water is warmed up, the heat speeds up the movement of water molecules and they're less able to stay near each other. They end up bouncing off one another and creating more space, such as in steam from boiling water, and resulting in a decreased density. Colder temperatures slow down water molecules and they're able to move closer together, resulting in a higher density of water. This means that warmer water has a lower density than colder water and will float on top. However, when water freezes and creates ice, the ice crystals form in a way that pushes the water molecules a little further apart. This is why ice always floats on top. It has a lower density than liquid water. Water is actually most dense just above freezing, around four degrees Celsius or 39 degrees Fahrenheit. The different densities of water at different temperatures affects how water in a lake is structured as the atmospheric temperature changes. Let's demonstrate this concept using ice, warm water, and cold water, and some food coloring. Here we have some really warm water that I've dyed red, and some cold water that I've dyed blue. The cold blue water has a higher density than the warm red water. So the red water should be able to float on top of the blue water and create two distinct layers. I'm gonna do this by carefully balancing the jar of warm red water on top of the cold blue water, and then carefully pull out a barrier, like how a magician We'll pull out a tablecloth and leave everything else behind. Ta-da! <laughs> now you can see that the cold blue water 
has a higher density and supports the lighter, warm, red water, creating two distinct layers that aren't mixing. There's a little bit of mixing where they mix and I pulled out the barrier, but that's okay, that's natural. What's important is that the two layers aren't fully mixing. Now, what do you think will happen if I flip the jars? Will they create two distinct layers still, or will they mix? Let's find out. So carefully, I'm gonna <laughs> flip the two jars. <laughs> and voila, <laughs> the cold blue water sunk into the red water. And now they fully mix, creating this deep purple color. This is because the heavy blue water sunk into the red warm water because as the higher density, they fully mixed. Finally, notice that if I add ice to either cold or warm water, it'll float. This is because ice at zero degrees Celsius has the lowest density. It'll float on both warm and cold water. Next, we're gonna explore how and when this happens in lakes and its impact on the ecosystem. This process of water separating into different layers is called stratification. When the layers become separated due to their different densities, it prevents the water in the lake from fully mixing. Stratification generally happens in lakes two times a year, during the winter and during the summer. Now, let's discuss how water in lakes changes over the course of the year and during the different seasons in a lake that stratifies twice a year. First, we'll start with winter. In the winter, the atmospheric temperature is often below freezing, or zero degrees Celsius. This cools the surface of the water and forms ice. Below the ice is the coldest water can be before it freezes. And as you go deeper into the water, it gets warmer since it's insulated from the cold air, thanks to the layer of ice on top. Therefore, during winter stratification, the lake forms layers with the colder water floating on top of the warmer water. This wintertime layer of ice and snow on top of lakes prevents dissolved oxygen from diffusing into the water and decreases the amount of sunlight that can enter the lake, thereby decreasing photosynthesis and the amount of dissolved oxygen available in the water. Also, there are still organisms living in the lake, using up the available oxygen and nutrients. So eventually, these resources in the water decrease and become less available. This can make it hard for many organisms to survive in lakes during the winter. To last the winter, some organisms migrate to different layers of the lakes in order to access different resources, such as dissolved oxygen, nutrients, and food. Thankfully, during the spring, the temperatures rise and the ice on top of the lake melts, allowing sunshine to penetrate into the lake ecosystem and more oxygen to diffuse into the water. The sunshine and warmer temperatures warm the top layer of the water, and soon the density differences between the layers in the lake begin to decrease, allowing the entire water body to mix. In addition, streams are flowing in with lots of new precipitation and snowmelt, bringing in nutrients such as phosphorus and nitrogen into the lake. All the sunshine and loads of nutrients allow plants to grow and resupply the lake with the dissolved oxygen it needs to sustain a healthy ecosystem. So now we have dissolved oxygen being resupplied, nutrients flowing in, and the whole lake is mixing again, spreading around all these necessary elements to all corners of the lake. Mixing is important to lake ecosystems because if a lake stays stratified, the layers can become depleted of nutrients and oxygen and become uninhabitable by the organisms living there. In the summer, temperatures get much hotter and the top layer of the lake becomes warmer and warmer. Eventually, the top layer warms up enough to become a different density than the water below. This continues happening until the lake reaches summer stratification or when the lake is warmer at the top and gets colder the deeper you go. You may have experienced this if you've gone swimming in the summer and the water around your shoulders is warmer than the water at your toes. Notice that this is the opposite of winter stratification, where the temperature increases as you go deeper into the lake. There's still plenty of sunshine promoting photosynthesis and no ice preventing oxygen diffusion. So the top layer of the lake has plenty of oxygen. However, the stratification prevents mixing and the bottom layer of the lake can become oxygen depleted. Therefore, in the summer, 
Many fish often retreat to shallower environments in order to have enough oxygen available. In the fall, temperatures drop and the density differences between the layers in the lake decrease once more. This allows fall winds to mix the layers after summer stratification, mixing dissolved oxygen and nutrients throughout the whole water body again. This completes the cycle of stratification and mixing in a lake during the course of a year. Now that we've learned about how the physical and chemical properties of a lake can change over the course of the year, we can better understand how this impacts life within a lake. In the winter, life slows down due to decreased temperatures and low oxygen levels. In the spring, oxygen levels and temperatures increase along with an influx of nutrients, boosting productivity and waking up organisms that hibernate during the winter. In the summer, life in the lake is booming. The water is teeming with oxygen and nutrients. However, summer stratification can prevent these essential elements from being shared throughout the whole ecosystem. So some organisms will have to travel to different habitats in the summer in order to have enough oxygen and food to survive. Finally, in the fall, dissolved oxygen and other essential elements are mixed throughout the water and organisms are able to spread out again before the cold winter temperatures come and winter stratification sets in. There are many other factors of a lake ecosystem that change over the course of the year or impact the density of water. But for now, think about how your favorite lake may be different today than it will be in a few months from now. It's amazing how resilient our ecosystems are and the systems in place that keep them in balance for the organisms that depend on them. For our next chapter, we'll be talking about how lakes can change over time and over the course of their lifetime. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.